Okay, welcome back. Any questions before we continue? All right. All right, so now what I want to do in your three ring binder, you should have what we refer to as the uh, driver's guide to hours of service driver's guide to hours of service okay now yours isn't in color but it's in your three ring binder so if you have that with you can follow along if you don't don't worry about it okay but this is what we're going to go over okay so this is going to be a review of what we've already uh, provided but then some additional things uh, and the big thing is some of these exemptions that I want to make sure that you understand, okay? So get that out of the screen for people. That's what you're looking for in your three ring binder. About halfway through it or so, okay? All right. So what are the hours of service regulations? These are federal rules. Who must comply? What's the weight at where it starts to uh, become applicable? Is this like 13? 10,001 pounds. Okay. Or placarded. Okay. Um, this guide explains the difference between intrastate and interstate commerce. Intrastate meaning staying within the state of Minnesota, interstate meaning crossing state lines. You have to follow the rules in either case. Minnesota has adapted the federal rules. Okay? All right. Now, the next thing we're going to get into here. I'm not where you at. You don't <laughs> need to have it. Okay. Don't worry about it. I love my name. Yeah, that's fine. As long, I mean, can you read what's on the screen? Yes. Okay. Don't worry about it. Let me blow it up just a little bit. Thank you. All right, personal use of a commercial motor vehicle. In the middle. That's about the Number fourth two page. Number two in the middle. Okay. Um, it's possible that occasionally you may not use a truck in commerce at all. You may be moving your personal belongings to a new house, or as a hobby, you may be taking your horses to a horse show. As long as the activity is not in support of a business, the federal hours of service regulations do not apply to you. If you're not operating in commerce, you're not subject to the hours of service regulations. So there's, there's two applications to this. The first application is using the truck for personal use. In other words, moving your household goods. You can do that. Um, taking your horse to a horse show. You can do that. Okay. Um, I race cars on the weekends and I participate in amateur events that are trophies only. That's not commercial use. My name isn't Jeff Gordon. I'm not Dale Earnhardt Jr. Okay. I don't get paid to drive a race car. So when I take my race cars to a racetrack, I can consider that to be personal use. All right. Um, now, unless you own your own truck, you're probably not going to do that uh, unless you work for an outfit like Interstate Truck Driving School. You know, the, the Class B trucks that we have, uh, my, my staff use those quite frequently on the weekends for personal stuff. You know, uh, one of the guys recently wanted to uh, uh, pick up some mulch at Girton's and bring it home. Uh, Bob's used trucks to... Uh, move family members, okay? I borrowed one of Bill's trucks many years ago. <laughs> My daughter, she, thought she was up in St. Cloud going to college. She's just a hog. 
He had more crap than I could carry in my vehicle. Mm -hmm. I brought Bill's truck to move her stuff yep. from St. Cloud State all the way back home to Farmington. Mm -hmm. So yeah. if if you work someplace where it were but I didn't want. Yep. If, if if you work someplace where you have access to a company vehicle to do that, that you're off the clock. Okay. So that's personal use of a commercial motor vehicle. The other thing that is uh, much more likely that you're going to encounter is what we refer to as personal conveyance. Personal conveyance means you're using this vehicle to get someplace, and you're not being compensated, and you're not loaded. And you're not even dispatched, okay? So let me give you some scenarios where this is applicable, all right? Let's say for the sake of discussion, you get done, you're, you're a flatbed driver, and you get done with your last uh, your delivery uh, Friday afternoon. And you call up your dispatcher, and you say, Fred, I'm done. What do you got for me on Monday? And he says, nothing. I'll get something for you for sure, but right now I've got nothing for you. And you say, well, as you know, I live down in Cannon Falls. I'm going to go home for the weekend. I'll call you later. Okay. That drive to Cannon Falls is off the clock. You are unloaded, and you are not dispatched, and you're going home. Okay? But you're driving the company? All right. You're driving the company truck. You got permission. They're allowing you to do it. You got a place to park it because you have a hobby farm down there in Cannon Falls. And so that's permissible. They're not paying you. Right. They're not paying you. You're off the clock. Drive as much as you want. So if you get pulled over by a trooper, you can say, well, what? I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, you say, I'm, I'm, I'm not working. Right. I'm off the clock. Personal. Con it's called personal conveyance. Okay. Now, remember, you can't have any load. So if let's change this scenario. Let's say that when you called Fred, your dispatcher, I'm done. What do you got for me? Uh, I got a load of shingles that needs to be in Fargo at 2 in the afternoon on Monday. And you say, okay, uh, well, why don't I pick, pick up the, can I pick up the shingles today yet? Sure. And then take them home? No sweat. Are you on the clock going home with those shingles? Yes. Yes. Okay. You would even be on the clock if, if Fred told you, yep, I got a load of shingles for you on Monday. Because now you're dispatched. Okay? So since Fred knows what the rules are and he's got this load for you, when you call him up on Friday, he's going to tell, well, I'll get you something, but I ain't got it yet. And he's doing that on purpose because he knows the way the rules work. And so what that means is you can take advantage of that and go home off the clock. Now, Sunday, you call up and you say, okay, so what do you got there, Fred? Fred says, shingles. Pick them up at 8 o'clock tomorrow morning. And you say, okay, well, tell you what, uh, after the kids go to bed tonight, I'm going to drive up the cities so I can get, because uh, the shingles are uh, up in Brooklyn Center, right? And I'm down in Cannon Falls. So I want to get through the, the city. I'm, I'm going to drive up Sunday night, and I'm going to stay at a truck stop up there at Osseo. That way I don't have to deal with traffic in the morning. Am I on or off the clock on Sunday night? Yes. On. Huh? On the clock because I'm dispatched. Because you decided to leave early. I was, I was given a dispatch that puts me on the clock. Okay? So Fred, being the smart guy that he is, I call him up on Sunday and I go, what do you got for me? Well, nothing firm yet. But I'll, I'll for sure have something for you in the morning. And then I'm going to say, okay, well, uh, down here or up in the cities? Up in the cities, uh, more than likely on the north end, but nothing for sure yet. <laughs> okay, well, tell you what, I'm going to drive up to town tonight then, and I'll call you in the morning and figure out what we need to do. Okay. Am I off the clock? Yes. Yep, because he hasn't dispatched me. Make sense? Yeah. So if you have not been dispatched a load and you're not carrying a load, you gotta have permission. 
So an owner operator can go anywhere they want. You know, you asked about how many hours. Well, the company's going to limit how far you can drive. It's their truck, right? But if it's your truck, you can drive anywhere you want. It's your truck, all right? Let's say you want to go to Houston for the parade tomorrow. You can get in your truck and drive to Houston. And as you go through a scale, let me see your logbook, personal conveyance. Oh, don't give me that garbage. What are you doing out here? Going to Houston for the parade tomorrow. I got a brother-in-law down there. Okay? Has to be your truck, no load, no dispatch. That's personal conveyance. Make sense? If you're dispatched or you're loaded, you're on the clock. If you're getting paid, you're on the clock. Um, let's say you're doing your 34 hour reset. Um, and here again, this would be most applicable to an owner operator because a company driver is not going to be able to do this. But let's say that you're at a truck stop with your rig for your 34 hour reset and you decide on that long day off, that day where you're off for 24 hours, you decide you want to go to the local mall and uh, watch a movie. You can unhook your trailer, drive that truck over to the mall, you're off the clock. Now, most truck stops are not going to let you do that, so let me clarify. But let's say that let let's say you're you know you're doing work for Walmart and you're at a Walmart warehouse, they'll let you do it. Okay, so it, it would be some special circumstances to allow you to unload a tra to drop a trailer and use your truck as personal conveyance. But as far as the rules are concerned, you could do that. Make sense? But okay. for example, in those type of case, if something happens to you, that would be a worse income because you're driving the truck. <laughs> Even if you go... When you're off the clock? Uh, if you're off duty and you get hurt, I don't think that that's a work comp injury. No. But you could argue that. Depends what state you're in as to how that works out. So I have a question. When you uh, drop the trailer or your truck, rather, uh, your, your load... Can somebody else just kind of drive up? And well, and that's why I'm that's why I'm saying that you're not going to be able to do this with any frequency. Yeah. Because of that. Okay. Okay. There's a security issue there, so you're absolutely right. So I, I'm not suggesting that this is something that's going to happen commonly. Mm -hmm. I'm just I'm just I'm just enlightening you that the rules allow it, not that this is necessarily a practical uh, occurrence. Okay. I used to do it going up in northern Minnesota. I knew the owner of a trucking company. When I dropped the trailer, I'd take the tractor, and I'd go out to dinner, and I'd go to a movie. Yep. Yeah, off duty. Yep. All off duty. All off duty. Yeah. You have to have somewhere secure for the secure. trailer. Right. Okay. Um, weight ratings. Um, the weight ratings that determine that the vehicle uh, meets the threshold that a commercial license is required again is on the door jam or it's on the VIN plate attached to the trailer. It, when, when I talk about weight ratings and licenses, people frequently bring up, well, the license plates I've got, that's irrelevant. It, 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 the license plate weight rating means nothing. It is the rating that the manufacturer built this thing to be capable of. That's what is relevant. Okay. Air miles and statute miles, as I mentioned on Tuesday, uh, the air mile is significantly longer, okay? Um, nearly 800 feet longer. So uh, air miles equivalent to 115 statute miles. Remember, the air mile is in a straight line. All right, 14-hour window. We clear on that. You cannot drive after the 14th hour from the time you came on duty. 11-hour driving limit. Exceptions to that. Adverse conditions and some other things we'll show you here in a minute. 30-minute rest break. Must be done eight hours after you came on duty unless you weren't driving. So if you drove for four hours and then we're working in a warehouse for another eight hours, that's okay. That's okay. You're not driving a truck. But now after that period of time you want to drive a truck you got to take a 30 minute break before you drive um, 100 mile air radius allows you to drive in that area without doing a logbook 
The non-CDL, that's a vehicle under 26,000 pounds. And then you're allowed 150 miles. The 100 air mile radius driver has to report to the same location he or she started at within 12 hours. A time record must be kept someplace. Our 60, 70 hour duty limit. So 60 hours over seven days for an outfit. If you work for an outfit that's not operating seven days a week. 70 hours over an eight day period of time if you work for somebody that does operate seven days a week. You don't choose this. This is determined by the business hours of whomever you work for. Yes. And what is an example of non-CDL vehicle? Under 26,000 pounds. That's non-CDL. See, if I'm driving a truck between 10 and 26,000 pounds, I have to follow the hours of service regulations. But I don't need a Class A or Class B but to do that. that's like a tow truck pulling sure. a car. Or, or, or like a that. dock truck. Okay. You know, these little dock trucks that yeah. you see? Yeah. But it would include a tow truck. Okay, um, all kinds of, of uses. Okay. Midwest fence here. Mm -hmm. The guys right here that install fence, those are commercial vehicles because they're over 10, they're under 26, so they don't have to have a CDL. Okay. Again, this guide is in your three ring binder, so it's a good resource. Uh, those of you that are watching at home, if you don't have this, you can uh, get this off the uh, federal website. Uh, if you ever want to look at this off the federal website, just Google um, <coughs> Driver's Guide to Hours of Service. And it's on the federal website. All right, the 34-hour reset. Taking 34 hours off consecutively takes the hours that you've been accumulating over the last eight days and resets it to zero. We didn't have this uh, until about 10 years ago. This made a significant improvement. Um, in our available hours. What is on duty time? Any time at a plant, terminal, facility, property of a motor carrier, shipper, or public property. Private property doesn't matter until you've been relieved. Includes inspecting, servicing, conditioning, fueling, washing, of course all driving time. Okay. You can sit in the shotgun seat for up to two hours on either side of an eight hour uh, time period in the berth. It includes loading, unloading, supervising, attending, paperwork, uh, all time taking care of your truck when it's broken down, uh, any sort of drug alcohol tests, work for anybody else that you're compensated for, all time uh, spent giving and receiving training. Um, and remember, travel time is counted. Uh, but what's the, uh, how do you wipe that slate clean for travel time? Yeah, Ten hours off. Okay. There it's talking about the sleeper berth. There it's talking about the travel time. What's off duty time? You need to be relieved from all responsibilities and free to leave the vehicle and pursue activities of your own choosing. So I gave you that example the other day, did I not, of uh, pulling in to a warehouse where the forklift was broke down, right? Okay. So any questions about what it takes to go legally into off-duty? Yes, sir. It's kind of confusing when you talk about the off-duty, but some of your, if you work at another job, you can be considered off-duty. Not can be. You are. If you get compensated, so if you have a, let's say you drive truck five days a week. Let, let's say you're a regional driver. And you're out for four nights, you come back on Friday night, and then on Saturday you go to work at Napa. That's on duty time. You're supposed to record that. And then any time that you get over the seventy hour mark, you need to take a thirty four hour reset. You pretty much can't have a part time job. Uh you can have if you work truck five hours, worked one day part time, you'd still be able to get your thirty four hour reset in. But you certainly wouldn't be able to work seven days a work week. Unless you work less than nine hours a day. If you work less than nine hours a day, then you can work seven days a week. But if, if you're getting in 60 hours in five days with the trucking company, then you're only going to be able to do one day of part-time work. Okay? So, yeah. Now, the reality is, do you suppose people are always recording the time? 
Just saying. Okay. <laughs> I'm just a messenger here. Okay. All right. Adverse conditions. Now, this is a biggie. This has to be something that you did not know about at the beginning of your 14-hour day. So it includes traffic crashes. Um, you know, in the summertime, when it gets real hot, we get those uh, buckling of the freeway. You ever seen that? That would apply. You can't predict that. You don't know about that ahead of time. Now, the normal rush hour traffic is not an adverse condition. Predicted weather events are not adverse conditions. But any deviation from what was known at the beginning of the run would be your adverse condition. So when I'm driving in, in poor weather conditions, I'm going to pay attention to every spin out. I might, based on the weather forecast, I might forget the whole thing. Okay? You know, part of what uh, we went out to um, Portland, Oregon um, in late April, and we actually ran into a... Uh, snowstorm in the mountains and then it changed the route. So the freeway we were taking, we had to uh, take a detour and go south because there was this big snowstorm up ahead. Okay? I mean, that's a part of the route planning too, is dealing with weather. I can't tell you how many times I, I pick up my phone before I head out and I look at my weather radar. What am I driving into? And if there's some big, huge thunderstorm thing with tornado warnings, I'm not driving into it. Does that make sense? I'm going to stop. Okay? What if you hear like an animal in the distance? Lack of sound? Just when you're closer? If you hit an animal? Like a deer. Well. Has that ever stopped you? Well, <laughs> has it? Not in a truck, no. I mean, I've, I've hit them with my car Whoa. and had problems with it. But um, I, I guess I don't understand what the question is about hitting an animal. Well, sure. Yeah, I mean, you can't predict you're going to hit a deer. Right. Yeah. So that would be an adverse condition. Sure. Okay. But out. see, the reason I'm a little puzzled by the question is it doesn't affect drive time because you're going to stop. Right. Well, that's not driving. <laughs> okay. And what this adverse condition is all about, it's about driving time. Mm -hmm. the, the big thing to understand about using the adverse condition exception is it no way, no how allows you to drive further. What it does do is allow you to complete what you should have been able to complete had that event not happened. So remember back when I was doing my logging exercise, I didn't go a greater distance. Yes, I exceeded my 11 hours, but I did not exceed my distance. That, that can't be done. Okay, There's, Unless the rules are suspended completely, and we'll get to that here in a minute, because there are times when they're suspended completely. All right? Yes. When you detour, like you said, you detour when you, yep. when you fuck up or yep. when you observe a hard part position, right. wouldn't that detour and extend your no. mileage? No. I'm not allowed to drive any further than when the rules allow me to drive, period. Unless the rules are suspended completely. But the adverse condition does not grant you the ability to drive any further miles, period. Not what it's designed to do. It's, it's designed to allow you to complete what could have been completed had the adverse condition not happened. Okay? But never allowing you to go any further. So I think that makes it pretty simple. Uh, non CDL, that's under 26,000 pounds. Okay? Uh, 16 hour short haul. That's the driver that reports to the same location every day. Uh, one day a week, you're allowed an extra two hours. So that comes up with what you guys do at Holland. Okay. All right. Now, here are the except exemptions, exceptions from the hours of service regulations. So we've already talked about the 100 air, 100 air mile radius driver. The exception is you're not required to do the logbook. The 150 mile driver, that's a non-CDL vehicle. They can go up to 150 miles and they don't have to do a logbook. Adverse conditions. Up to two hours additional driving time. The 14 hour window is not changed. 
and whether a traffic condition must be unknown at the start of the run. There's three exceptions for agricultural. Now, these three agricultural exceptions, these guys don't have to follow any hours of service regulations at all. They can drive 24 hours straight, and they're not breaking the law in terms of hours of service. A fatigue driver shouldn't be driving, but that's a different regulation. We're talking about hours of service. So the first one, transport transporting agricultural commodities, farm supplies within 150 miles of the farm during a planting season. Are, are any of you familiar with farming? Sugar beet harvest, any of that? I mean, those guys literally go 24 hours. The next one is for the non-CDL vehicle. So that really doesn't apply to us. But the important thing to understand, this is a vehicle with farm plates. Um, and there's no limitation on distance for these lighter vehicles. Now, we're here to talk about uh, commercial motor vehicles. So that's the next category. Now, this is a vehicle driven by the owner or operator of the farm. Um, It can be an employee of that person. This is transporting agricultural commodities, livestock, machinery, or supplies to and from the farm only. It has farm plates. It's not for hire. No hazmats. Anywhere in your home state or extending up to 150 miles into another state. So this is a farm vehicle. So this first one back here, this is during planting season. Okay, that's during planting season. You can use a truck with regular license plates and be exempt. If it's not during planting or harvest, then it has to be a vehicle with a farm plate on it. Okay, so that's a significant difference there. In Alaska, 15 hours of driving, 20 hours of duty time. In Alaska, okay. Anybody been to Alaska? Great state. Why do they get more? What are you going to hit, a moose? <laughs> I don't know. You know, why does anybody get an exemption? Because they got a good lobbyist, that's why. Construction materials, you can do a 24-hour reset. You don't have to do a 34. You can do a 24-hour reset. Um... Driver's record of duty status, uh, you don't have to log it if it meets those uh, exemptions we already talked about. Uh, the eight-day thing, the drive-away, tow-away, uh, the truck was manufactured before the year 2000. Driver salespeople uh, have a modified logbook. Emergency relief, okay? So this is a biggie here. If it's a declared national, regional, state, or local emergency, all hours of service regulations are off the table. Okay? Um, we just had a couple of hurricanes, right? Mm -hmm. After those hurricanes, they were declared as national emergencies. All right? After those uh, hurricanes, the truckers that were hauling supplies, relief supplies, to Houston and to uh, Florida did not have to follow any hours of service regulations. And they're getting like three bucks a, a mile, and they don't have to follow any rules. So they can drive eight, nine hundred miles a day. How'd you like to drive nine hundred miles a day and get three bucks a mile for it? Not bad work if you can get it. Okay. Uh, emergency driving conditions: legal run could have been completed if there wasn't an emergency. Uh, the example I gave you the other day was what? <coughs> The guy ahead of you goes off the road, bounces up and down, rolls over, you stop to assist. That's an emergency. Okay? Federal government operated. No hours of service regulations required. Fire, rescue, emergency, government, uh, and non-government if it's, you know, like those private uh, uh, forest fire guys. They don't have to follow any rules. Groundwater well drilling uh, can do a 24-hour reset. Logbook not required in Hawaii. How far are you going to drive in Hawaii? So let's go around the island again. You know? <laughs> High rail vehicles. Okay? And so they, they, they don't have to follow the 14-hour rule. Time spent in transportation to and from duty assignment not included. Um, so if you're working in the rail industry, then that is applicable. Okay? 
local government operated. So MnDOT snowplow drivers don't have to follow hours of service regulations. Movie and television uh, production, they got 10 hours of driving time, 15 hour extendable window, 8 hours off duty. Why is that? Because again, they got a good lobbyist. Oil field. Now, this is interesting, okay? 24 hour reset, restart allowed. But the second one is really a, a, a significant uh, exception. Waiting time at a natural gas or oil well site is not counted as on-duty time. Now, you've heard of people going up to the oil fields and making uh, buku bucks, right? Um, the, the, the guys and gals out in the oil fields are making in excess. Uh, they're making $2,000 a week. All right? Now, what, what I would want you to know about that before you consider it is they're working 80, 90, and 100 hours a week to do it. Well, how can you do that? Don't you have the 70-hour window? Well, first of all, they can do a reset in 24 hours, not 34. But secondly, and most importantly, the time that they spend at a well site does not count as on-duty time, and they're getting paid for it. So that's kind of interesting, isn't it? They're getting paid, but it doesn't count. Now, why is that law? Because they got a really good lobbyist. Yeah, and they're typically between 18 and 20 bucks an hour, and they're making two grand a week. How do you make two grand a week at 20 bucks an hour? Cousin, 50 hours of overtime. My cousin uh, worked in Alaska, yeah. well, in Canada, and um, he made those bolts to get that gas. That, yeah. And he made $60 an hour. $60 an hour. Yeah. But he, he drives those big trucks. Yep. Yep. So there's big money there for sure, but it's lots and lots of hours. Huh? Yeah. The gas truck. No, the one that makes that hole. The oh, drilling. The, hole. the yeah. drill rig. Oh, okay. Yep. They keep you hopping. Mm -hmm. All right. Personal property, property, occasional transportation, transportation unrelated to commercial activity. Pipeline welders when meeting certain requirements. Propane, winter, heating, fuel, pipe, and pipeline emergencies, okay? Um, railroad signal employees, um, when they're engaged in installing, repairing, or maintaining the signals. Ready, mixed drivers, logbook not required. Again, the concrete industry must have a good lobbyist. Um, they don't have to do the 30-minute break. Um, or excuse me, they can use the time waiting at a terminal or job site as the break. Okay. Uh, retail store deliveries. Notice what time when that applies. That's coming up soon. Uh, school bus contractor operated hours of service regulations do not uh, affect transporting kids to and from school. If it's a government operated school bus, then they don't have to follow any of the rules. All right. Um, so what's interesting is is that a contract-operated school bus delivering kids to a hockey game and back that counts as hours of service. <coughs> but the government school bus can do it without counting it as hours of service. So that's kind of weird. Well, owned by the school district. Uh, short haul exception, we've talked about that. State government operated, don't have to follow the rules. Tow truck responding to an emergency uh, when, uh, you know, dispatched by the by a government agency. Transportation of bees, you don't have to do the 30-minute break. Okay, I guess those bees are pretty tender. And then same thing with livestock. So you got cattle in your truck, you don't have to stop for 30 minutes. Why is that? Well, because especially if it's hot or cold. The animals need to get to their destination. Right. The animals need to get to their destination. Same thing with the bees. Utility service vehicles, especially involved in any sort of uh, repair stuff, doesn't include construction, just repair things. Okay. So, several exceptions there. Any questions about that? 
Then the guide gets into the sleeper berth. And what this area of the uh, sleeper berth talks about is the splitting that we did earlier when we were going uh, heading for Atlanta when I stopped on that log and spent eight hours in the sleeper berth that extended my 14-hour window, okay? So that's explained there. There's a diagram of it, an explanation, and then they actually diagram it here. So again, this guide is in your three-ring binder. And again, you can Google this. In most guys, they don't spend eight hours in the paper just to extend their 14 hours. They'll spend 10 hours just to start their whole day over. Yeah. Yeah. So he said, you come to work at oh, 10, yeah. you begin so driving at 10, at 2, you spend 8 hours in your sleeper. At 10 p.m., you resume driving. Those 8 hours in the sleeper berth do not count as part of your 14 hours. Right. Now, and this is complicated, isn't it? Right? Yeah. So here again, my intent by showing you this was not to get you to a point where you really understand how it works and to use it. My intent was to show you that it is an option that's in your toolkit that can be used. So what my intent was is that if this comes up in, in your job and somebody says, okay, I want you to do this eight hour split, you're not going to go, what? Huh? The heck are you talking about? I ain't never heard of that. Okay. So now what you're going to say is, oh, yeah, okay, um, you're going to have to help me out with that. I, I know you can do it, but I'm not real sure exactly how. So how do I do this now? That's all I intend there, okay? I mean, it's a, it's a complicated process. Um, but it's, it's something that's an option. So since it's there, I want you to be aware of it. Make sense? You know, my responsibility is to empower you to be successful in this industry. Um, so, all right, so what's the log? It can, at this point, it can be paper or electronic. As of December 18th, it, be, it becomes electronic <coughs> with some exceptions. So here's our 100 air mile radius again. Here's our non-CBL short haul again. All right, what must the log include? So, without a doubt, it has to have the date. Without a doubt, total miles driving today. So, again, if, if you're doing a paper log, you're going to track that. You're going to be writing down your odometer readings to figure that out. You're going to be doing math. If you're doing this electronic, it's done for you. Uh, trucker, tractor, trailer number, name of the carrier, main office, your signature, name of co-driver if you have one, Time base used and remarks. Now, in remarks, this is the area where you must list city, town, or village and state abbreviation when a change of duty status occurs. You should. Notice it doesn't say you must, it says you should. You should also explain any unusual circumstances or log entries that may be unclear, such as encountering adverse conditions. Now, you are allowed to put anything you want in remarks. What you're required to put in remarks is the city and state. Okay? You have to figure that out. You are also required to do the total hours on the right-hand side of the grid. You are not required to fill out the far uh, right recap area. That is not required. Okay? So the far right side here is not required. The column under total total hours is, but not the far right. But it helps to keep you on track for what you did that week. Absolutely. Okay. An electronic log is going to do that for you. For oh, you. Yeah. All right. Shipping document and shipping uh, name of the shipper. So there is the graph grid. So it has to be done on a graph grid. The electronic device has that. Can't do it any other way. It's got to be done with a graph, graph grid. Uh, with a normal logbook, there are four duty statuses. Off-duty, sleeper berth, driving, and on-duty. The logbook that's going to be different is going to be the oil field operations. 
So now they come back to remarks. They already mentioned remarks, but they come right back to remarks again. And they're simply doing this to emphasize how important it is. Every Each time you change your duty status, you must write down the name of the city, town, or village and state abbreviation in the remarks section. If it changes at a, at a location other than a city, town, or village, you must show one of the following. The highway number nearest mile post followed by the name of the nearest city, town, or village and state abbreviation. Or the highway number name of the service plaza followed by the name of the nearest city, town, or village or state abbreviation. Or the highway numbers of the two nearest intersecting roadways followed by the name of the nearest city, town, or village and state abbreviation. So it absolutely, positively, unequivocally has to have the city, town, village, and state abbreviation. You may write other things in the remarks section. There's no limit to what you're allowed to write in there. If your company has a policy of putting this or putting that, put it in there. Okay. So that's what a completed grid looks like. Explanation of what they've uh, put there for us. A completed log. We've got date. We've got miles. We've got vehicle numbers. We've got the name of the carrier, the uh, address. We've got the driver's signature. We've got the grip gra uh, graph grid. Um, we've got the shipping papers uh, numbers. We've got our locations and then our total hours in the far right. That is a legally completed log right here. Remember, you have uh, 13 days to submit the original to the carrier. You keep your copy for at least seven consecutive days. Okay. The oil field logging operation, again, is different. The waiting time at a well site is tracked, but not counting as on-duty time. That's why there's a fifth duty status on a well site logbook for the oil fields. Okay. So that's, that's the huge difference there. All right. Automatic onboard recording device. The key here is this device is plugged in, either hardwired or Bluetooth, to the vehicle. And when the vehicle gets moved, the device knows it, senses it, records it, tracks it. Okay. So it must be mechanically or electronically connected to the truck to automatically record at a minimum engine use, road speed, miles driven, date, and time of day. It must have that. If it is, that's an automatic onboard device. Electronic uh, logging device, um, it's similar, um, but it isn't necessarily tied to the uh, uh, vehicle. Therefore, it's not a compliant automatic device. Okay. Right. Any questions? What do you think? It's a lot of information. It's a lot of information. <clears throat> okay. Um, anybody in the room that doesn't have a smartphone? Raise your hand if you don't have a smartphone. Okay. Uh, anybody in the room that doesn't want to put an app on your smartphone to use to learn electronic logging? Okay. All right. Now, based on... Tuesday's attendance, I have set up in my system the following people for electronic logging. So I want to go through these names. If there's somebody else that wants me to add this, I'll have to do it at break. Uh, Eugene, are you here? Okay. Uh, Kyle? Okay. Uh, Christine? Okay. Osman Mohammed? Okay. Anthony Burgens? Nice. Anthony? It's not here. Uh, Muhammad Bobby, okay. Did I say that right, Bobby? Yes. Okay. Michael Berger, uh, Elizabeth, okay. Uh, Ahmed I Ibrahim, Ahmed Ibrahim, not here. Uh, Michael Henderson, okay. Uh, Lashanda, okay. And Zalim, okay. All right. Anybody else that wants me to add your name to this? Matt. Oh, it's already added. And you are? Uh, it's Dion. Dion. Didn't I do this before? I don't think so. 
Okay. What's your last name? Crocker. Okay. Um, Felix. Felix. Anybody else? Okay, so what I'm going to do, we're going to take a break now. Uh, I have to enter these names into the system, and then when we come back, we will uh, download this app into your phone and look at the electronic process. Okay? And my so, name is on that list, right? LaShonda. Yes. Yeah. Okay, I'm just making sure that's what you All right, take a break.